Happy New Year, Bucketeers. What intrepid folks you are. Here we are with the coldest morning of the season so far with a high of below zero today in Grinnell, Iowa. And we have a room full of people. I think JR does that to folks, doesn't he? <laughs> We're delighted to have you here. I'm Joanne Bungie. I chair the Community Education Council, the CEC, which sponsors the bucket courses. I, we have to get back in the habit of doing things again after the break, so I want to remind you to please silence your cell phones and turn on your tea coil. You will notice these bright, cheery sheets of paper uh, that are around the room. Those are the announcements. Uh, and especially if you're a first-timer, please take time to look those over this morning. It gives all the rules and regulations and things that you may need to know during the course. Uh, we have uh, been busy during our break, actually, with the planning committee. And one of the things we did was to add a member to our planning committee. If you were here every Wednesday morning at 8.30, you would see him helping us set up uh, the, the room meticulously uh, and take care of all the electronics and all that sort of thing. He is also working with Jack to uh, put the, our, our programs on the YouTube. Uh, and he has volunteered and become so indispensable that we can't do without him. So we made him a member of our committee. <laughs> I'd like you to welcome Bob Weimer. Bob. Uh, our, this is the first class of four class series on uh, loss and grief uh, taught by Dr. J.R. Paulson. I have introduced J.R. so many times that you know everything there is to know about him. Uh, he is primary care physician at Grinnell Family Care and a master of just about every trade you can think of. So it will be enough to say that uh, we need to welcome back uh, our community's resident genius, Dr. J.R. Paulson. <laughs> How's the sound in the back? Perfect. Good. Good? Okay, well, these introductions get better and better. I'm going to quit being one of my head. Uh, well, thanks for having me. Do we want to get some of the overhead lights a little bit or not? I appreciate you coming out in this weather, and uh, I think the topic is more of a testimony than me. And uh, we hope these next four weeks are enlightening and enjoyable. We'll start off with. Oh, good grief, Charlie Brown. And uh, need to be able to have this thing arranged so you can see it. Or, more broadly, how to deal with loss. So I have a class on grief. You can never escape death in taxes, right? We all agree on that. But I would add grief as a third thing that you not want to escape. Well, I have a class on grief, as it was chosen. I was asked to talk about this by the bucket list committee. So that's why we have this. So the first thing I want to do is why then are you here? And what do you hope to learn from these classes? Those of you that are in hospice know that when I do my hospice volunteer programs, I often start out with what are you volunteers, what do you want to learn in this spiel that I'm going to give? It's easy for me to come up and say, okay, this is the stuff I think you need to know, but I like to find out what do you want to know. So there's a lot of uh, expertise and experience in this room. And so I want to start out and take about the first five minutes. Just raise your hand. If you have one thing that would make this class worthwhile that you would want to know or, or learn or find out or discuss or something, what would it be? So I'd like you to just... Think about it, raise your hand, a question, and we're not going to try to answer it, we're just going to write it down. Uh, our resident scribe, Tommy, is going to write it down, and then we're not going to stop at about 20, and then, but I want those because I want to change some of the latter part of the class to make sure that's all covered. So, throw some things out. 
Money. Well, it seems like when you hear that a good friend of yours is in hospice or is dying, you almost start the grieving process then. And how do you relate to that person then who is dying during this process? How do you relate to a person who's going through a dying or good process? Boy, start out with the easy ones. <laughs> <laughs> How do I get through the grief and back to a satisfactory life for myself? How do I get, get through the grief, get through the grief whatever, the grief is, whatever it is, and, and get, get back, back to, a life that's satisfactory for to a life that's satisfactory for me? Yeah. Um, I want to know how I get through the grief and view it. Uh, the whole thing as a positive experience instead of something that I dread thinking about or that's, that seems harmful to me? How, how do I turn it around and, and make it a growing, um, growing experience? Okay, let me try to paraphrase it and see if it, you will do this. How to paraphrase or how to transform grief into actually a positive yeah. experience, mm -hmm. if that can be done. Can be I don't know. Maybe you can't. I can do to help prepare my loved ones and my family for my own death and make it easier on them. Great. Question, what can I do to prepare for my family and loved ones to make it easier for them with my eventual death? Very tough. Joe. How do you get people to identify what's happening to them after someone dies? is that they're actually going through a grief process and that they're not just over the death. Uh, how do you get people to recognize that they're actually in the grief process and maybe not ignoring it? Is that what you're saying? Yes. Mm. Some people go and don't really, they kind of pretend that they're not going through a grieving process. How do you get them to do that? Wait. Keep going. Do you have to go through grief? Do you have to go through grief? <laughs> That's a good question. Yeah. <clears throat> How about children? How do you deal with children when the family is grieving? And uh, how do you handle uh, uh, having them understand the grieving process and, and what it is to a child? How do you deal with the grieving process with children? And that's a real sticky wicket, isn't it? Because the kids are different ages, understanding, what do you do, what do you say, how to not... Michelle? How does one identify whether they're going through a normal grieving process or maybe they need more help? That's another question. How do you know if this is just kind of normal grief that we all go through, or the point that they've kind of gone too far and they got a real problem now and they're going to need some help or a physician or it's pathologic or it's gone into depression or whatever. Excellent. Um, there's a, well, all, time, all kinds of grief and not necessarily death, but um, loss um, due to a child uh, with special needs or, uh, you know, things that happen like they don't have to do with death. But, but they're definitely a loss um, to all the family members. Um, uh, how do you deal with loss and not necessarily this not of a death mm -hmm. or something that's about to die? Mm -hmm. and she's not planted, by the way, but she's going to lead right into the mic. Oh. A little farther in the lecture. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Where do you find that help and how do you evaluate? Because it could be not good help. Ooh. How do you? Where do you find? The where do you find good help, and how do we evaluate it? Because not all help is good help. Yeah, very true. I was thinking about what was mentioned that a person doesn't die, but they're lost. Like if you have Alzheimer's, or we've had the experience in our family where the person's not the person. 
and you do grieve. You grieve every single day, on and on. Great question. So what about, for example, Alzheimer's, when the person you've lost, the person that they haven't died, but you've lost what made them the person that you love to relate it? Yeah. You guys are getting good. <laughs> Just think of your own life, sticky wickets that you've had or anticipating, or family members having you going through. Dorothy. Well, there, there are all kinds of losses as we age. And a lot of that is a grieving process as well. Uh, I don't compare it to the loss with the death. But there are many losses that the elderly face as they lose different capabilities, capacities, and how to handle that and for their families to handle that is a I have a very important question. The average age of this group is over 35. <laughs> I was just looking around the room. I don't want to make you feel old, but I think it's over 35. And some of you, and I have my hearing aids in, and my cataracts, you know, we experience different losses physically and mentally. And how do you deal with that? Very, very good question, apropos to people over 35. But even younger. And how do other people, what was the corollary to that question? How do, how do how does family, how can you help family deal with that? How yourself? can you help family deal with that also? I, I think there's a lot of personal uh, guilt involved with the loss of a loved one. And how does one deal with that? There oftentimes is guilt involved with the loss of a loved one. And how do you deal with that? <coughs> what is the normal time frame for grieving? Is it going to be, you know, on average, years or just, is there some kind of Time time. Is there a time frame or a kind of timetable that's, that's kind of normal that you'd expect by this time this would happen and this happen? Excellent. And if you don't follow it, should you feel guilty? Completely? And if you don't follow it, should you feel guilty completely? George. Yeah, this may be off the wall, but how do people feel? Your party's just lost a big election. The country's going to hell in a hand. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the question is political loss. <laughs> so Waiting for the I'll sports fans to come up with a, and I'm a Hawkeye fan to say something about, and I'm a football fan that is sports loss. Yeah, yeah. So Stan just said, what about downsizing? What about downsizing? <laughs> okay, seriously. Uh, job loss. Yeah. yeah. What's the or well, job position or emotional error. Yeah. Are there physical um, effects of grief? Is, do you feel physically different when you're grieving? Are there physical signs and or symptoms of grief? <coughs> Excellent. I hope that didn't go bye-bye. It'll right back when you twiddle the mouse. Yeah, if I twiddle the mouse? <laughs> what mouse? Oh, okay. Yeah, I did come back. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, yeah. <coughs> Two things that we associate predominantly with military, but can happen to anything, is survivor's guilt and PTSD. Ooh. 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 Survivor's guilt, not the respect of military, but, right. and also military post traumatic PTSD. PTSD. But you can suffer PTSD after a car accident. That's right. That's what you're yeah. Well, okay. So, not just military wise. Right. Although, yeah. Would you folks agree if we can, yeah. Well, we're, uh, spiritual yeah. aspect of breathing. The spiritual oh. aspect. Uh, questioning, if where is God in this? And 
Yeah, the spiritual aspect of grieving. Where's God when you need him? Or where is there God? I mean, yeah, so that's very, Keith is our chaplain, so he's very uh, into this. Would you agree if we can answer all these questions, we'd be have a pretty kick rear end class, right? Plenty to think about. Plenty to think about. In lot of I've been going on kids, post traumatic stress, guilt, blah blah blah. Well that helps me kinda of know where to go. Now I, the first class already got kind of programmed in my brain, but we'll see if we are thinking on the same level. So why talk about grief? I have about 12 or 13 reasons why I think we should have this class. When I talk about it, it's universal and part of the human experience. We can argue about these, all these points, but these are my hypotheses. Two, most of us do not and have not dealt well with grief and loss. Maybe you have, maybe you have. I hypothesize that most of us haven't done as well as well as we think we have. Unresolved grief may lead to serious, as Kathy mentioned, physical and mental illness, as well as diminish our full potential for happiness. Unresolved meaning what? Unresolved grief, and we're going to have to define what that means. Uh, grieving is the most misunderstood and neglected growth process a person can go through. How we deal with grief is a generalized coping mechanism that we consciously or unconsciously use to deal with any loss. Any loss. <clears throat> we learn these different mechanisms as children and have them reinforced by our present society on an ongoing basis. We are ill-prepared to deal with loss ourselves. Others are ill-prepared to help us deal with loss. Yes. <laughs> we are fairly well prepared and equipped to deal with physical pain, but very poorly equipped to deal with emotional pain. Both can leave lifelong scars. Physical scars, you can see, but scars, just as significant mental scars. Often, even the professionals who are supposed to help us with grief are themselves poorly prepared and impotent in the face of major grief. So we're going to talk about that. Over time, the pain of unresolved grief is cumulative. Incomplete recovery can have a lifelong effect. I would suggest that grief and loss are the major factors that move us left or downward on the emotional continuum. How many of you were here for the class on emotional well-being? Okay, for those of you in, in uh, YouTube land or other folks, I'm just going to review that real briefly. We have our continuum of emotion where here would be suicidal, and up here, remember, was nirvana or heaven. And we emotionally, this is really good. And this is really bad. Remember that? And I had you say where you are, what area you kind of live in. So I'm kind of living in here. But remember, I had you as a homework assignment say, tell me when your best days were, up here, and when were your worst days, down here. And when you wrote those, and I looked at those, 95.6%, when you were moved down this way, it was from a loss. Loss of a child, loss of a relationship, loss of a job, loss of something. I think in your own experience, and you will because your homework assignment tonight, we'll have to do that. But, so my hypothesis of that is, things that move people down on our emotional continuum 
are losses. So the question is, how do you get back up and go in that direction after you've been knocked down this way? Or do you stay down this way? So people come down and stay down and never go up. One of the things we'll find out later, just on the physical continuum, just wishing so doesn't make you go that way. It's going to require effort and actual things to do, which I think we're going to plan on talking about. Okay. So we need a definition of grief. Would most of you be happy with this definition? This is what Miriam Webster says. No. So it's a deep sadness caused especially by someone's death. Most of you, I think, thought that when I came in here and was talking about this, I'm going to talk about death and dying and how to do with people that have lost loved ones and, and more about that. Yes, that's true. Do other animals grieve? Is this a uniquely human experience? No. I don't think snakes grieve. But higher mammals grieve. We see that any of you have them know that. Two more definitions of grief that Webster has. Keen mental suffering or distress over affliction or loss. Sharp sorrow, profound regret. Regret. Go on that. So, there's some regret that you have, something you did or didn't do, or should have done. Deep mental anguish as arising from bereavement. I think we can all recognize grief, sometimes when we see it, often in ourselves or in someone else. Clearly after tragedies, you can tell these people are grieving. This is a picture from Sarajevo. We have lots of sculpture that captures the human emotion of grieving. Artwork, particularly religious art, is often filled with grieving. I like this modern interpretation of grief. You know, I just pause and contemplate that. It's the bag, partially invisible, the nudeness stuff. Just, it just gets me at a gut level that I don't have to emotionally think about. Music, me, when I play the pathétique, Tchaikovsky, whoa. Literature, you do a whole class on Greek literature. Not only in the East, but in, in the West. Read the Diary of Anne Frank, see if you don't come up with a little grief. Or I like Leo Tolstoy, one of my other favorites, The Death of uh, Ivan Vidyach. That's a classic. But grief is a reaction of all law. So that's the first key point I want to make. So we're talking about grief, yeah, definitely not. But I'm going to say it's all loss. Most people don't usually see the relationship between the loss of a person and the loss of other things in their lives. What else can we lose and therefore grieve after? You've already mentioned a couple of them. Functions as we get older. Political elections. Sports games. Limbs. What? Limbs. Limbs. Pardon? Divorce. Marriage. Divorce. <coughs> what other things can we lose? Do you want another chronic disease? Chronic disease. Health. Pets. Pets. Our keys. Our keys. <laughs> Physical <laughs> items. What's the reading process? <laughs> yeah. Our keys. Oh, hey. Can't find your keys. Where's your iPhone? Like, oh, geez. Leave over that. What? Heat. Heat. 
Loss of heat today, perfect example. We grieve over the loss of heat. What about young kids? What about, uh, so we talked about sex a little bit. What about loss of virginity? Either planned or unplanned. What about males, loss of, of sexual functioning? What about men, loss of jobs? Loss I mean, there are more things that you can think in the physical arena. Loss of time. Loss of time. What do you mean by... Um, the days gone by and what happened? Or what happened? The years have gone by and here I am. Uh, loss of myths. Well, it's not, well, I'm not going into detail, but you know, when was it that Santa Claus kind of got lost or went, got blown up or went bye by? Your pet. That can be very significant and severe. The marriage. And we're going to especially talk about, spend time on marriage and kids when there's divorce. I mean, we got a whole little subsection because how that's handled or not handled has big implications for adults and particularly kids. Loss of a job, downsized, demoted. Oh, we're just submitting for somebody else here. Donaldson's closing. You, you'll be out of here in 15 months. Or Ryan GT just got brought out by so and so. Your job isn't going to be here, but I'm 56. How am I going to retool? What am I going to do for that? Does that have a grief? Is that a loss? Is it significant? But nobody died. Yeah. I want to say we go through the same procedure. I love this picture. What does it express? A woman having losing a breast mastectomy. So if you focus on that, just the physical trauma, but what about the emotional trauma of that? What does that mean to self-image? All of that. I surveyed all the doctors in our community to see how much uh, grief training they they got in there, and I'm gonna we're gonna talk about that a little later. Financial, all of a sudden the stock market goes down, or your savings is, or somebody invested at the Chinham, is that a loss? Yeah. Powerful loss. Grief over? Yes. Refugees. She's lost her country. Everything she owns is in that little bag. No home to go to, no country. She's displaced. Twelve years to slave. What did he lose? Freedom. Can you lose freedom? Can you grieve over it? Yes. Military. They just had a fallen comrade. I hypothesize, and we'll talk about more later, specifically about this in several ways that you brought up, that once a person goes to war, I don't mean stateside in an office, once you go to war and experience killing and up front, there is a process that goes on that's supposed to be stress whether you call it that or not. That you are changed forever, and there's a grief, there's a, a call it an innocence, when you see that horrible brutality that you are changed forever. How you deal with that, or don't deal with that, I hypothesize is grief. How many men were killed in Vietnam? 58,000 about. As of a decade or so ago, how many men that came back uh, died of suicide? Thousands. Over three times that. So more people died from their own hand then died, they got killed in war. So if you say grief and mourning and post-traumatic stress, doesn't matter, it does. <clears throat> Aging, which we all are going through. What are the losses of physical, mental, how do we deal with these? Or don't, or do we ignore them? Or what, what do we do? <laughs> A-Rod, famous baseball player. So, what? Oh, good grief. Okay. So here's our, our, our baseball icons, and we're finding out they've been both, they've been taking 
steroids all along, you know? Oh no, I don't use that stuff. Yeah, right. But the loss of the pureness of baseball, that those of us remember, that, you know, how you did was dependent upon your performance, not on what drugs that you used. I've recognized this guy. How great and happy we were. Until that. But is this a loss? It is a huge loss. For not only for him, but for all of us who were got into this. It's a loss of faith, a loss of integrity, a loss of... You see what I'm saying? This is kind of a big deal. What about Bill and Monica? Depending on what... The loss of... What? I didn't have sex with that girl. With that woman. The loss of... Trust. Trust. So can you lose trust? Yeah. Who's this... Edwards, not Edwards, and his wife. And remember what happened to he and Elizabeth? Yeah, a little trust uh, lost with him, not only from her and the family, but nationally. He was a, he had a hope and aspirations of a lot of people were on his back, and he broke that trust. And one of the things we're going to find out is. How do you be getting through grief is asking for forgiveness or whatever. But on her deathbed, John did not get, get absolution. Yeah. Absolutely. Our whole country lost. The question is when, when Kennedy was assassinated. It was a loss for everybody. Everybody agreed. I can't think of anybody that didn't go. I was a kid in high school. Our class was just like, oh, we just took the wind out of us. It's like that. that that could happen and did happen. Because we, so we went through national grief. And still do. Is that significant? Yeah. What about loss of icons or concepts? This slide is just to, and we'll get into it later importance of religion in here. This is a reference to uh, the wife of Jesus. So if you ever follow magazines or different things, you find out that, yeah, they found another, the Gospel of Mary. Mary. Well, what do you do with that? Wait, Jesus was married? Maybe, no, no, no. Because that was the loss of this set the thing that I had. So what do I do with that? Or do, I, do I make that as a loss or do I deny it? And, you know, so there are losses of concept, losses of things that we hold on to. Is there mass grief and mass loss? How do we do we? How do we process that? So we have our own personal grief, but what about the, the grief on the scale that's of the Holocaust? Or Rwanda? 800 to 900,000 people. We just can't even fathom that. Within 100 days, we're all wiped off the face of the earth. Grief? Mourning? I mean, not just people, but every, I mean, what about the rest of us? Or do we not, well, that doesn't concern us. That's over in Africa. Well. Or today, in present Syria. What's going on over there? A little grief, a little loss? Yes. Obviously. So, grief is universal and ongoing. So, we ought to have strategies to deal with it. So, if I made the point that. Yeah. So, let's take a break and get the carbohydrate loaded, and then we'll come back and start having some. talk about some ways that we can look at this picture of grief and maybe start dealing with it. Okay? I hope there were some of your favorite cookies left out there. It's a great time. Thank you for uh, coming back to your chairs. Uh, I want to remind you that we had many more people who wanted to register for this course than we were able to accommodate with our limit of 90 people for the fire code for this room. So if, if there is a time where you are not able to come for a class, 
please notify Jim Arms. He has a waiting list of folks, and he will let somebody else use your spot for that day. And of course, there's no charge for that person because you've already paid the tuition. So please remember to do that. Now, if you have a friend that you can just tell, uh, I'm not gonna be there, you can go. That's fine too, and have that person tell the people at the registration desk that they are there in your place for that day. So uh, also remind people that they can uh, find the classes on our YouTube site. And there are little cards out there that tell you what the YouTube site is, and it's very easy to find. And once you get on that YouTube site, click on playlist for the latest classes. So that this class should be on uh, by tomorrow. So if anyone uh, is interested in it, you can tell them that as well. So now back to JR and Good Grief. Thank you. I guess we'll get the lights up over there too. Okay, well I hope I've teed up the ball and have you motivated to learn more about grief. It is universal and it's ongoing. You're not going to get away from it, like taxes and death. So you ought to have strategies to deal with it. Hence the course. So let's have a definition. Three definitions. Grief is what you feel. It's what you feel. It's emotional suffering. Mourning is what you do. And we'll talk about rituals, religious and otherwise, later. Bereavement is what happens. It's the period of mourning after loss. How long is that? We're going to talk about. How long should it be? Is it? Yeah. The medical definition I looked up separate from the dictionary is the normal process of reacting to a loss. I think that's kind of neat. Underline normal. Normal process. Now, it does go awry, and we'll have to decide when is it going awry and when is it normal. Reacting to a loss, any loss. The problem today in our present society is that we don't view or treat it, like I think death, as normal process. We've created a large number of dysfunctional ways to try and avoid it as much as possible. That's my own assessment of the problem. Death several generations ago was at home. Grandma and Grandpa was there, they were sick, the doctor came, they died there, everybody saw it. You had the body there, showed it, everything happened. Now, Grandma gets sick, she goes to the ICU in Des Moines, or here. Kids don't see Grandma again until they see her at Smith's funeral home. You see the difference? It's, it's just, it's totally different. Like, what happened to Grandma? She was okay yesterday, and now she's laying here in this casket. What, what happened? Well, this class and the objectives I have put together are how we are taught to deal with loss. We're going to go into that in a couple minutes. Why these strategies don't work. Why others, although well-meaning, are often inadequate supporters. So we want to be helpful, or others wanted to be good, but they're usually inadequate, in my opinion. The defensive mechanisms we often employ to try to cope with loss. And we have a number of those that we'll try to identify. The background, social, and religious structures that help mold our responses. But later, as you know, my other classes, I'm going to talk about what does this grief and loss look like in the Japanese culture, in uh, Mexican culture, in different cultures in different times. It, it's different because it has to do with the cultural template of what you're taught and told. Likewise, religion has prescriptions for what to do or not do. What are the various stages and patterns of mourning? Are there some? 
who Bloom Ross was talking about, she had some stages of death and dying. But she also wrote a book on grieving as she was dying herself for the last four or five years of her life when she had a major stroke and was bedridden. She was not a happy camper. She was not going through acceptance, even though she said she was supposed to. Yeah, do people go through? So what are the <coughs> different parameters for that? Um, what are the specific steps and processes one must complete before achieving resolution, reintegration, and closure? So what, what is the end of meeting? Is there an end? What does it look like? And how do you get there? How do you, yeah, good question. Well, I'm going to try to deal with that. Specific challenges and difficulties of children with grief. Big, 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 big. Lots of issues with that. Four-year-old, seven-year-old, teenager. Other specific losses. What about multiple loss? So-and-so died, and so-and-so else. Things back to back. That's very specific. <coughs> Suicide. Also different. Different set of grief parameters. You see why? A lot of guilt, often on the living people. Sure, do. if I would have done this, and, you know, if I only would have seen this coming, or right? That you don't have if someone dies at 95, it's of old age. Divorce. I'm going to talk about that specifically. Loss of relationships. Maybe a certain relationship with your kid or your coworker or other people. They can be very painful and they can be grieving in their loss. Violent crime, that's also different. When a relative is killed violently, there are different emotions and different things that go through than just if they just die of just, just die of something else. Because now there's an anger component. How do you deal with that? Uh, PS, post-traumatic stress disorder. Sudden death. When the person is alone, they just fly. There's no clue that this is coming on. Bam. I got a call yesterday, one of my patients. The home health nurse went in to see her. She was in her 50s and just called me right away and said, we call the ambulance because she's not moving and I don't know if she's alive. Hospital. Her body temperature was 93 and she probably been dead for about four or five or six hours. Just sudden. And for the living people, how do you, that's different than if someone's going down hospice and they're on it for a couple months. We're going to talk about these specific things. The important concept and condition of anticipatory grief. Not only death and dying, which we do in hospice, we really try to help the patient and the family try to come to some anticipatory grief, and we'll talk about the importance of that, but anticipatory grief about, I am going to get fired. I didn't pass this test. <laughs> I'm going to fail my history class. I haven't got the grade yet, but it ain't looking too good. I didn't get into medical school. My MCATs were good enough for the first year. And I don't think it's anticipatory. How do you deal with that? And the concept of completing an emotional relationship. Um, I'll go into detail on that. This is people that maybe our parents, maybe other people, usually they've died. And we never had a chance to complete that relationship with them. And that still gets us here forever. And we're going to talk about how to help complete that, even though the other person is not here. Yes? One that I kind of run into is adoption. Adoption. From the, all different points of view. Yeah. I like parents, the kid, exactly. So that will, if I don't cover that, let's bring that up. And I'm adopted, so I have an interest in that also. So part one, we are ill prepared to deal with loss. We are taught how to acquire things, not how to lose them. In all our formative years, we are taught how to acquire both material and non-material things. We are told that doing so will make us successful and happy. We seek to acquire our parents' praise, toys at Christmas or Hanukkah, good grades, and acceptance from our peers. 
Marketing campaigns continually bombard us with the theme of finding contentment and happiness through the acquisition and possession of things. Not only physical things, but also fame, success, degrees, notoriety, praise, etc. You think, well, that's okay, those aren't things, but they still involve getting something and losing something. And if you don't get the thing you want, you'll be in a happy camp. The converse, losing something, feels wrong, unnatural, broken, and painful. Therefore, we'll do almost anything for attention. We know with kids, good or bad, they'll do anything to get attention. Work or overwork for money. Acquire material possessions. Win at any cost. Gee, did we just see a couple sports figures uh, about that? while at the same time intensely craving the praise and acceptance of others. That is, by conforming to our social group. Even if it clashes with our own personal values. One of the number one causes of suicide in kids has been and is today bullying, and now it's cyberbullying. Think about it, the importance of acceptance to a teenager. If you are totally ostracized or embarrassed by your peer group, and everyone in school and everyone on the internet is making horrible statements about you on the internet, very often that's time when you go in the bedroom and hang yourself. I'm not trying to over-dramatize this. If you don't believe me, just talk to people who work in this field. Uh, to be criticized, Lose their praise or support is nearly intolerable for most. As many of us older also. Hopefully if we got older, we, eh, we don't care quite so much what other people think or say, but it's still in there and uh, it's pretty tough to overcome. We are taught myths about dealing with grief. Since we all had and will experience losses, we by default have to deal with grief one way or another. Learning started at an early age. This is reinforced throughout our formative years. These patterns, for the most part, are not true or effective ways to deal with grief. Nonetheless, they persist into adulthood, and I think are pretty well solidified in most of you, as they are in me. But one of the things we're going to do, we'll have some homework assignments where we will be given an opportunity to explore ourselves and our early teachings and see how much of this that uh, is for you. So what I'd like to do is go through first six common myths, there's more, but I'm going to do six first, that I think we were all taught on some level or another. And I want to use them with real life examples. And uh, some of the ones I can do for patients that uh, I don't have to mention names or anything about. And uh, one that I'm going to use now is from uh, a psychotherapist uh, talking about his own experience as a kid growing up. But I think all of us can relate to this. This is about John, and he's a real person. His first memory about learning to deal with loss came when he was five years old. He said, quote, we had a family dog. This dog adopted me from the moment I arrived home from the hospital. When I was old enough to crawl, I pulled the dog's tail, and she let me get away with it. The dog would go everywhere with me. As I grew older, I tried to teach the dog to retrieve. To this day, I'm not sure who taught whom to retrieve. <laughs> The dog always found a way to sleep with me each night. This drove my mother to distraction. But the dog and I were persistent, and eventually she gave up. Then one morning, I called my dog, and she wouldn't get up. I remember how cold she felt when I touched her. I remember being afraid. I called my mother to help me. My mother told me that my dog had died. I'm certain she tried to explain what death was. I'm also certain she didn't know how. For the next several days after the dog died, John cried a lot and spent a great deal of time in his room. Quote, my parents felt inadequate in knowing what to do to help me, he remembers. Finally, in total frustration, John's father said, don't feel bad, John. On Saturday, we'll get you a new dog. Now, it doesn't sound like much, but it's a profound sentence. Let's take a closer look. 
John is not only seeing what his parents are doing, but understands what they say. So his father said, don't feel bad, meaning bury your feelings. That's the subtext. And on Saturday, we'll get you a new dog, meaning replace the loss. John was starting to get the picture. He began to form belief about dealing with loss. He tried to be strong and to follow his father's advice. To a young child who wanted his parents' approval, this was a powerful communicator from the most important authority figure in his life. As John explains, I thought if this was the way my father deals with death, then this is the way I'm supposed to deal with it. The real message was, if you lose something, you should replace it as soon as possible. Replacing the laws will make it easier. Sure enough, on Saturday, John's dad took him to the kennel and they got a new dog. Quote, I still miss my old dog, but I didn't tell anyone. I didn't think they'd approve. I also found it hard to love the new dog in the same way I loved my old dog. And I didn't know why. It's possible, in fact, and likely, that John couldn't love the new dog because he wasn't finished loving the old dog. So, we've already learned two things as a little kid. Several years later, someone stole John's bike. He's eight now. As stated earlier, we grieve grief for losses other than death. Loss or theft of the bike caused him to be both angry and sad. Once again, his parents were there to tell him, don't feel bad, on Saturday we'll get you a new bike. They didn't know it, but they were reinforcing this message, clear your feelings or replace the loss. When John was 14, he fell in love for the first time. <laughs> It may have been puppy love, but to, to him, uh, it was wonderful. He was preoccupying his thoughts all the time. He had trouble eating and sleeping. The birds sang. He listened to love and songs on the radio. He didn't hang out with his friends much. When we broke up, he said, I was devastated. This was a major loss for me. For days, I wandered around like a wounded duck. Finally, my mother couldn't take it anymore. <laughs> what his mother said was, don't feel bad, there are plenty of fish in the sea. <laughs> By this point, John had gotten some pretty clear ideas about what to do when you lose something. Bear your feelings, replace the loss. Now, let's see how this information affected John in his next loss. In 1958, he was in high school, my grandfather died. He was very important in my life. He was probably closer to me than my father was at that point. Every summer I spent at his farm. He taught me how to fish, how to hunt, and how to play baseball. When I was told that he died, I was sitting in one of my high school classes. I can remember going numb. It was like being in a trance. After several minutes, I began to cry, and I suppose that made everyone uncomfortable. So they sent me to the principal's office so I could be by myself. Since they didn't know what to do, they decided to send John to the office to be alone. Nonverbal, yet powerful communication, placed another piece of invalid information into his mind, meaning, leave alone. Once again, I assume the adults around me knew what they were doing. This attitude of handling pain alone was further reinforced when I got home that night. My mother was sitting in the living room with her head down and was obviously crying. As soon as I saw her, I wanted to go to her so we could cry together. Both my father and my uncle came to me and said, don't disturb your mother. She'll be okay in a little while. Meaning, grieve alone. John now had three pieces of data on how to deal with loss. To find out that these didn't work very well. 
He said, I try not to feel bad. Remember, bury, bury your feelings. But you know, I felt terrible. But I wanted adults to think I was doing okay. So I acted as, as if I was fine. On those occasions, the pain was overwhelming. I'd go to my room and hide my feelings. Remember, grieve alone. Because that's what I thought I was supposed to do. Then came the major problem. It dawned on me that it wasn't going to be possible to replace my grandfather. We couldn't do what we'd done with our prior losses. For over a year, each time I tried to drive down the road where my grandfather lived, I couldn't do it. Every time I saw someone who resembled him, I crossed the street or moved away to avoid them. I carried on conversations with him in my head, and he came to my dreams. I couldn't stand to be around older people because I knew they'd soon die and leave me just like my grandfather. I finally decided to talk to my father about what I was feeling. When I finished telling him, he said, you're grieving, but you'll get over it. <laughs> Meaning, just give it time. This is probably, in my opinion, about the worst thing that we perpetuate myth. Just give it time. Mistaken idea that given enough time, it's going to make us whole again. It's preposterous. Now, the sad part is most of us believe that that's true. Just give enough time and everything will be fine. Um, if you had came on somebody that had a broken hip that was laying there, would you say, oh, just give it time. <laughs> Someone's having a chest pain, just give it time. We never think about with physical pain, just give it time. Get the two professional and do something about this now. But the motion, we don't know how to deal with it. So we just say, give it time, give it time. Look, look it over, give it time. Now, the next mistaken idea that we have is we're taught myths about dealing with the past. So let's go back to John. John's story about his grandfather, he mentioned all this time that he spent on the farm hunting and fishing. He wanted to relive these moments. They were great moments. But he wasn't ready to let his grandfather go. He wasn't, it wasn't time for his grandfather to go. He wasn't ready because he, and when he used the word, was not emotionally complete with his grandfather. All his life had been taught about not showing or talking about feelings. He wanted to thank his grandpa one last time for all the things that he'd done for him. But this type of communication scared him in the real world, at the real time. So he never told Grandpa, Grandpa, I really appreciate all this stuff. I love you. I just died. Because he was afraid to do what emotionally he did. And he started wishing that he could change things that happened. And this gets us to a paradigm that I'm going to spend a lot of time on. Wishing things were different, better, or more. We wish we had said we loved our spouse more. We wish we would have spent more, more time with our kids when they were growing up. We wish we sh these, these things. I wish this would have been different. Blah, blah, blah. And those things are not resolved. The truth is we all try to do the best we can. Now, mistakenly, we feel bad about that ourselves. So John's feeling bad. So people come up to us and say, you shouldn't feel guilty. Well, I wasn't even thinking about guilt. <laughs> now, we planted the seed of guilt. So now, the guilt is there, and we have this regret, not about this person dying, we do, but 
that we didn't say, but we have guilt for not having done this, that, or this. And it wasn't. We just wish things were different. More, they live longer, or better, or things happen. But, but now we're carrying guilt around. So therefore, the person who wants to think about grandfather, he starts to think about grandfather, and he thinks about the fishing and all the good times he has, but then what happens? It leads right in, unfortunately, to the these bad things. Oh, geez, I wish I should have told him this and that, and oh, I should have done this, or my husband died of a heart attack, and if I would have called the ambulance earlier, or if I would have paid attention to this harboring in a couple days, if, if I wish he wouldn't be here, and it's my fault, and I'm guilty, and see how that goes? So now you don't want to bring those memories up. So what you do is you throw the baby out with bath water, and people just don't want to go there. You take back to revisit, because it's incomplete. There are these negative things going on. And anything that leads us to pain, we naturally want to try to avoid. Okay. So, regretting the past. Different, better, or more? The next thing we're taught about dealing is don't trust. This happens to be myths about the future. Continuing on, John. His father was an alcoholic. His father was intoxicated. He repeatedly spanked him for things he didn't do. So even though I would tell him it wasn't my fault, he didn't believe me and punished me anyway. It seemed very unfair to me, and my faith in him diminished. What John was learning was to expect fear and betrayal, meaning don't trust. Since the loss was never acknowledged or settled, the suspicion of adults expanded. He had difficulty forming trusting relationships with all authority figures. I'm not saying that this general loss of trust was right on my part. What I'm saying is people don't like pain. And so unconsciously, they will try to avoid even the possibility of a repeat. So John learned, do not trust. Now, how does this become a vicious cycle? Let's go back to his girlfriend. When he broke up with his girlfriend, it reinforced the idea of not trusting people. From that point, he found he had great difficulty in trusting the girls he went out with. He was more tentative and held back since he didn't want to be hurt again. That limited his capacity for liveliness. We've all heard that relationships are supposed to be 50-50. That's not true. They should be 100%, 100%. But for John, he kept waiting for the other person to put their 50% in first. Then he put his 50% in. Well, if you go on relationships with people like that, because he wanted to be safe. And you're not going to do too well in long-term relationships. If you're waiting for the other person to put their 50% or, or... So, he grew up having trouble with relations, afraid of repeating the pain in the future. So, why do these myths persist? First, the mind from my class previous, uh, or a couple of classes back on the truth, remember, it's there only has access to what information has been given. So this is how John is taught, and we are taught to deal with grief. <coughs> Secondly, information is not stored in isolation, but often coupled with emotion in our limbic system. Remember we talked about that? It's also stored with the importance of the source attached. So think that mommy and daddy said when we were little, they get locked in there deep at that emotional level. And third, the mind's job is to believe that's always right. Remember our tooth class? So if you don't agree with me, then you've got to be wrong. I remember we, you know, talked about that. It's the self thing of the, yeah, right, that's what we're doing. So therefore, these things continue to go wrong. It's not only natural, but healthy for people who are grieving to seek solace from those around them. But usually, not only are others not of much help, 
but often they make us feel worse while continuing to reinforce the myths we've already had, we've already learned. So I'm just going to give you a brief introduction of what we're going to do next, and then talk about our homework assignment. So part two, which we're going to start tomorrow, is others are ill-prepared to help us deal with loss. They don't know what to say. They're afraid of our feelings. They try to change the subject. They intellectualize. They want to deal with it with this higher prefrontal cortex, analyzing stuff like that. They think that keeping busy helps. Let's just keep busy and get back in there and get back to your job and do that. And they don't want to talk about death. And they want us to keep our faith. So if we're angry at God or something, I uh, can't. So these are some, so we're going to talk about all of these and find out how those got in our next, in our next class. And then, after that, we're going to go over the patterns of grief that people kind of follow where they get booby-trapped, and then suggest ways that we can go through this and heal and get rid of some of these myths and replace them with some real concrete, helpful information. All right, now, the homework assignment is for those of you that choose to do this. <clears throat> and I'm going to do this myself, too, because I'm in the same boat that you are. I've been brainwashed, and if you want to call it that, for grief. And I'll talk a little bit about my feelings for my death of my mother and my father and where I'm at now with those. But the way to do that is we form a and you do this on a full size piece of paper that you just and you do not have to bring this back to class uh, with you next time. And uh, this is called a loss history graph. So you, this is when, you tell me when you were born, like in you know, 1947 for me. That's here. This is how old you are now. I'm not gonna tell you how old they are now. And you divide it in half. And then in quarters, just so you can get a, an idea. And then what, what we'll do is, you go back to your first loss. It could be of your doll, your blankie, your brother. I don't know, you may get lost in the neighborhood. Your first memory. Mom went away and didn't come back. I didn't know if she was ever. I mean, your first thing. So for John, one of his things is the, that dog loss. You draw a line down of the emotional weight. How bad did you feel? So he, and you may have to adjust that after. So this is dog died, and so this is whatever it was, let's say 52. So you want to let the date. Then uh, out here, broke up with girlfriend. Girlfriend breakup. And that's when he was in, maybe he was 12, so 12 years of age. Then we just saw grandfather dies. Did he grieve over that? Big time. So. Grandfather's death here. As we go on, maybe we're going to find out later, one of these guys, let's say he goes to Vietnam. And trust me, most people who have gone to Vietnam and seen comment, they've got loss of whatever. Maybe it's physical, mental, both. So maybe that was Vietnam. <coughs> Uh, maybe somebody's uh, father died, but he didn't grieve his father too much because his father was an alcoholic, remember? He wasn't a great dad. He had different feelings about his dad. You think, well, dad's going to be down here. No, dad's not much farther than his dog. I mean, seriously, you see? So you just kind of be honest with that. And then there's going to be another spot where 
brother died, or lost this, or had stroke, lost this, or became alcoholic, a loss of sobriety, um, a divorce. How much is that? One of your kids doesn't have anything to do with you. Said, ah, you raised me crappy. Ah, I talk to you again. That's a loss. So the, the loss of your the length of the loss, loss is the degree of that. Does that make sense? Yeah. So what the what this is going to do is those who want to do it is have you go back in time table. Now the, the whole thing will probably take half an hour to forty five minutes, maybe an hour, because. I'd like you to do this first, and I'd suggest you either do it today while it's fresh in your brain, or before you come back next time. And we're not going to bring this to, to do, and I'll tell you how we can process this later. We're not going to do it in some big thing, because this is too personal type stuff. I'll share some of mine, however. Um, and then, I want you to write a little bit, just like I wrote you here, about the loss of your dog. You know, the loss of my dog. I thought I was going nuts. Other people thought I was going nuts. You know, I couldn't, or I felt horrible, but I didn't know why. Something about her. Or, Grandpa went off to the hospital and we never saw him again. He was cremated. I never got to see even Grandpa in the body. I don't know. But, but, but some details about, went to Vietnam, station, saw people massacred. Best friend killed. <coughs> Chaplain did this. Or, you get, you get what I think? And, but try to think of the things that you were taught and how you dealt with it at that time. Or didn't deal with it at that time. That's to get your brains going for this loss of health. If it's diagnosed with cancer. That's a pretty big loss. How close is it here? Hospice patients that we've got. And there, we're working out here for them. So we try to find out their loss history. That's going to get us into anticipatory grief. See, if you can see what's happening, then how can we prepare ourselves or others for something that is going to happen? Loss. Make sense? Now, again, it's just personal level, but later what I do in, in real therapy is ideally we have been people a little ahead of myself, but I just want you to do this, and I don't want you to, you can't share it with anybody, it's, but, but later, if you want, we're going to talk about how, as other people are brought up to speed on this, how do you deal with somebody else that's had a grief? So if you did something that was horrible, and I want to help you, and you and I are going to, we're going to be a friend, we're going to share our graphs. And you're going to kind of tell me about your things, and I'm going to kind of tell you about my things, and you see, I'm not going to be judgmental. Or you want to do it with your wife, or you guys want to do it, or I do it professionally sometimes. And they come in and find out where they're at, how much unresolved grief is there or not. And I will find just that briefly on mine the very difference of the death between my mother and my father. Uh, my mother died in my arms. I went to Mayflower, had a heart attack, I was with her. She had lived in Grinnell for a long time. And that's one death. My father, I was away at graduate school, getting my master's, and got the phone call. Dad died. So, how did I process? So, I'm going to have to go back and do some work, too, about this and think, well, how did I, what did I do or not do? What kind of emotions did I have? And course, one of the things, don't be afraid of, remember what's our, our third or fourth myth? First one, don't deal with feelings. They, this isn't just an intellectual thing. So if, if it's not bringing something up down in here, you're probably just dealing on that. Oh, well, so-and-so died of this. And, you know, you tell me all the specifics about it, but you kind of want to write in there how you felt. And also, how do you feel now? I never did deal with that dog's death. <laughs> or, I don't know. Wherever you're at. Tell me, fun? <laughs> well, <laughs> that's a lead in. So I hope somebody comes back next week. But, but uh, uh, you know, we're going to 
to move on and, and find out what others do or don't do right, and then we're going to try to learn things we can do right to help others, which would be good, because then frankly, they'll be helping ourselves. Then we can get into specific things. So hopefully I get more to do some technical feeling. And, and again, we'll talk about other people with it, but uh, again, this is the first thing you don't have to necessarily get together with somebody. You don't have to anyways, but it's, it is very useful when you do have a partner to someone else that to bounce things off. We'll talk about why. Also, a little bit, the first couple minutes next time, you brief about what this experience was like for you. That's your homework assignment, as Mission Impossible says, if you choose to accept it. <laughs> so, thank you for uh, your attention. Thank you. thank you so much, JR. We'll see you all back here again, same time, same place, next week on a hopefully warmer day. Thank you for coming this morning and stay warm all the way home.